Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Now, the pharmaceutical industry do not want to cure people because if they if they cured people, they'd go out of business because everyone would be healthy and they wouldn't be needed. So why would they why would they do that? Why would they ruin their own business? All they need to do is to keep you just well enough to keep needing their tablets. Mm. And that's common sense. You know, I don't know, don't need to be going to university to work that out. It's the, the names involved on that island, Epstein's Island. It, how, how are they getting away with it? How are they not even being asked questions about it? You know, even if they weren't, you know, even if they weren't guilty of any crime, the fact that they were on that island, the fact you know what that island was about, it came all came out in the trial, and yet none of them would get questioned. Not even question, not even a question mm -hmm. from the authorities. It's just bizarre. Where does your loyalty come with Southampton and all that? Because there's been teams come in, Chelsea, Man U, mm. 10 million, you were apparently going to be the biggest British transfer. Like, where does your loyalty come from, Southampton, and why? Even though you might disagree with me, you should still be sticking up for my right to have an opinion. Because I'll stick up for yours. I, dis I might disagree with what you say, but I will, I will never tell you you're not allowed to say that. Or I'll never ridicule you for what you believe. If that's what you believe, that's what you believe. Let's get on with it. It's right. You, you do need a certain kind of mentality to be able to cope with uh, the criticism that comes your way and you know the, uh, the media setting their pack of wolves on you and on social media when you, you say something that they don't agree with. Um, but quite frankly, uh, I don't really care for the opinions of morally corrupt individuals. But I, I, I certainly feel like my views have been misrepresented um, by a lot of people in the, in the mainstream media. Uh, and obviously there's a reason for that is because uh, I don't no longer fall for their propaganda. Uh, and so they will try to ridicule me for that because I'm questioning their entire existence and what they do for a living. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got football legend, Matt Letizzi. How are you, brother? I'm good, thanks, mate. And you? Yeah, really good, really good. It's a bit of drama there. I locked myself out of the studio and <laughs> we had to wait a bit, but hey ho, we're here it's now. A costly mistake, eh? Exactly, mate. You heard the <laughs> price they charged. Um, great footballer. I know you back in the day, like, yourself, Shearer, like, unbelievable record football. Caused like a bit of controversy with the conspiracy stuff, which we'll touch on <laughs> later on in the interview. But first and foremost, how are you, brother? I'm good, mate. Yeah, I can't complain. Yeah, it's really good to see yeah. you, mate. No, it's good to see you too. Football and legend, like I say, you've got the rights to be dubbed one of the greatest footballers to ever play in a football pitch. Like your goals, both foot, like unbelievable. Thanks, mate. Your penalties, was it 47 out of 48? Yes, yeah. Mark Crossley, just the one miss. Yeah. First midfielder to score over 100 goals, I'm correct as well. In the Premier League, yeah. My knowledge is unbelievable, Matt. You'll probably <laughs> see that, mate. <laughs> I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Where you grew up and how it all began? Uh, so I grew up on the tiny Channel Island of Guernsey. Uh, I was the youngest of four boys. Uh, sport mad family, football mad family. Um, my three older brothers were all pretty decent footballers themselves. Um, uh, and I grew up a very sheltered life in Guernsey. Um, very relaxed. Um, 
like next to no crime on the island. It was just a beautiful place to grow up. Enjoyed my school. Didn't work particularly hard at school because I knew I was going to be a footballer. Um, from an early age, I kind of, uh, that was all I wanted to do really. And I knew I was, I, I was good enough to do it. Um, and so, yeah, most, if you look through my school reports, <laughs> they all say something along the lines of, um, Matthew could do very well in this subject if only he applied himself properly. <laughs> and that was kind of the theme running through everything apart from PE, where I just got brilliant marks because mm. I was good at, I wasn't just good at football. Um, I was good at cricket. Uh, I was good at tennis, table tennis, uh, pretty good snooker player, um, all sorts of sport really. I, everything that was a round ball, not that funny shaped ball. I didn't didn't do that sport. What made you put the passion into football? Uh, I think it's because it was the one I was the best at and it was the one I had the most natural ability at, I think. Um, and I knew from kind of quite an early age that I was that I was pretty good. I didn't know exactly how good because the football, the standard of football in Guernsey, you know, it's a small island, tiny community. So you didn't really know until I came over here uh, and started playing against the guys from the mainland, just, you know, how good I was in comparison to guys that have had kind of professional coaching and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't really have any of that till I was probably nearly, nearly 15. What was, uh, who was the oldest out of the brothers? Uh, my eldest brother was Mark. Uh, he was the only defender out of the four of us. Um, uh, he was a, a pretty decent footballer um, who, see, I think if we'd have actually grown up as a family in England, I think we would have all been professional footballers. So Mark was the only defender. Then Kevin and Carl were, I would I would say, equally as talented as I was at football. Um, you know, I grew up playing with them and their mates uh, and they had unbelievable ability. And they both had chances to be professional footballers, but... They didn't, they got homesick and didn't want to leave Guernsey. Um, and so they, they never took their chances. Um, that's why I say if we'd have grown up in England, I think they would have they would have definitely been footballers. What was mum and dad like? Mum and dad were um, really, really hardworking parents. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot. We grew up in a council house uh, in Guernsey. Um, they worked two jobs uh, at times to make sure that there was... You know enough enough food and enough uh, enough clothes for us all, um, uh, and they were just really uh, hardworking, loving parents. Um, but they were quite they were quite fiery at times as well. You know, if, and and they had to be because they had four boys with strong personalities, so they had to keep him in line a little bit. So uh, so dad had a temper when it when it suited him, and so did mum. You know, and we grew up uh, with pretty good discipline. Uh, because of that, um, but also grew up having a lot of fun. Um, I mean, Guernsey is such a, a chilled out place to grow up as a kid. You, you've got the beaches on your doorstep whenever the sun's out. Um, and it just is a, a really, really relaxed way of life over there. And everyone knows each other. You know, you don't go, you don't walk past five or six people without knowing one of them. Um, uh, and it was a lovely place to grow up. What was the population? Uh, it's now about just under 60,000, I think. That's uh, quite a lot. Uh, it, it, it sounds like quite a lot, but, you know, it's uh, it, on an island that's only three miles wide at its widest point and nine miles long at its longest point. <laughs> There's not a lot of space on there, yeah. so uh, so you do get to know a lot of people. Everybody getting on each other's tits. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it takes a special kind of mentality, I think, to... Uh, to want to stay in that environment um, because it can be it can be a little bit claustrophobic. Some people have have, have said that about it, um, and that they've wanted to you know kind of kind of get off the island and go and look at uh, a little bit of the rest of the world and see what the see what life's like on the rest of the world. But honestly, it's it's a lovely place. And do you know what? If I hadn't made it as a footballer and I'd have had to force to spend my time uh, my entire life on Guernsey, I wouldn't have had a problem with that at all. Did you ever? Look at other people who are maybe older, who's maybe doing the same job there for 30, 40, 50 years and think to yourself, is there more out there? Because a lot of people do say, oh, no, like you say, if you were there, you'd have been happy. But did you just see something more? Um, I saw I saw football, really. Um, so it wasn't necessarily that I, wasn't necessarily that, that I wanted to move out off of Guernsey. Um, but for me to be a professional footballer, I had to, you know, and I... I 
came to that realization at an early age, having seen my brothers turn down their opportunities, I was like, blimey, I'd, I'd never do that if I got that opportunity. Um, uh, and so my mum, my mum and dad helped with that as well because they they would send me away to uh, soccer schools on the mainland as a kid without them. So I'd go with one of my mates and my mate's dad, and they just got me used to being off the island on my own uh, to try and you know when the time came, it wasn't such a daunting thing for me to to leave the island. Did they see that ability? And you, I know you say you've got natural ability. Everybody's kind of got something natural ingrained in them but you've still got to work at your craft that oh yeah what was your your daily routine like as a kid 12 13 14 15 with a ball um i don't, I don't remember having a routine <laughs> um, uh, but i can certainly i certainly remember playing as soon as school was finished i'd be out my school clothes um you know into my sports gear and uh, rounding up mates for a game of football in the in the winter, rounding up mates for a game of cricket in the summer, uh, just any opportunity I had, I would I would play sport. I was just obsessed with it. Do you think you'd have been successful if you chose cricket as well? Uh, yep, I do. Um, the confidence, Marty boy, I love the confidence. <laughs> no, and uh, and the reason I say that, I mean, I, I had I had a pretty good um, eye to hand coordination. Uh, and I, I, you know, my timing was good when I was playing cricket. I, I scored a lot of runs as a kid, um, but not just that. Uh, the reason I've got so much confidence in that is because I knew I had the, the right mentality to be successful in whatever sport I chose. Um, so I think the, the mentality side of things is something that gets overlooked a little bit when it comes to professional sport. Um, I think everybody looks at your ability, uh, but I think also you've got to have the right mentality. What was your team growing up? Spurs. Oh, uh, my dad was a Spurs fan, uh, and when I grew up, uh, the first person really that I saw that made me kind of fall in love with football and want to be a footballer was Glenn Hoddle. Great player. Oh unbelievable talent um, and I, I just loved the way that he made the game look so easy uh, and that that was the thing that gripped me uh, and it, there's kind of a, a bit of a theme running through all my all my heroes of the various sports that I've played um, uh, you, you wouldn't be surprised that it was people like Ian Botham uh, it was people like Jimmy White Snooker of uh, Alex Higgins of um, so uh, Ernie Els at golf and they're all people that just made their sport look effortless you know such such natural ability but also a great mentality um and i think that was one of the things that you know has helped me um actually probably more these last couple of years than it did in the first <laughs> 50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll touch on that obviously for mum and dad were a bit strict and it's kind of made you a bit thicker skin towards life and whatever shit that you've got to take on <laughs> from the outside but so when, when did you take the leap then and, and go to Southampton for uh, time? Well firstly uh, I actually um, went to Oxford first um, I think I was about 14 or 15 so I left my school in Guernsey and went to live in Oxford was it S form back with, then? With my date, with was that S form or anything you had to sign back then, or like a pro contract? Uh, no, so um, so I I hadn't really signed anything. Uh, I went to live in Oxford, changed schools to go to school in Oxford, and I was going to train with the Oxford youth players in the evenings and at mm. weekends. So that was the plan. Uh, and I moved to Oxford in the Easter holidays. I stayed with my dad's my dad's mate, uh, and then so I was there about two weeks obviously through the holidays and I started the next term at school there and I rocked up at school this first day school was massive like I'd just come from Guernsey but I, we had like I don't know 100 people in my year this school that I turned up at was like four times bigger than the school I'd just been at um, and I was doing subjects that I'd never even done at my old school and I just remember not not a single other student speaking to me the whole day it was just like a new kid in school no one's gonna speak I, and i just felt so so isolated uh and so i went back uh wasn't very happy after the first day at school so i thought well, i'll give it a go surely it can't be that bad the next day so i went back the next day <laughs> still no one talked to me uh and i just thought i can't do this so i said to my dad's mate i went 
I said, I can't do it. I'm, I'm not happy. I said, I can't do this. I want to go back to Guernsey. So I did. Um, but I knew uh, that at that point, Southampton had showed an interest in me and had offered me a trial. So I went back to Guernsey, went back to my old school. Uh, and then I went to Southampton for a, for a week's trial. Uh, and at the end of that week, they signed me as an associate schoolboy. Um, and then the good thing about that was they didn't mind me staying in Guernsey to finish my schooling. And I would just fly over to Southampton like half term and in the holidays just to train with the guys then. Uh, and then about a year later, uh, the decision was made from all those people in my year. They were choosing nine players to be given apprenticeships at Southampton. What was a YTS scheme back in the back in the day, the youth training scheme. Uh, and I was one of the nine chosen. I just had a letter. Didn't have a phone call or anything. We just had a letter that came to our house um, and signed by Laurie McMenemy saying that we, we want to offer you a, an apprenticeship. Nine uh, people? Only nine. You must have had some fucking t school team. <laughs> no, no. Uh, out of all the um, all the Southampton schoolboys. So there was like, yeah, yeah. I don't know how many, maybe 40. Wait, I thought you was getting 40, nine yeah. people no, from no. your school team. No, so like the 40 or 50 schoolboys yeah, in that year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they they knocked it down to nine. So yeah, that was um, that was in May 1985. So I left uh, on July the first, uh, 1985, and uh, I stayed the first night I was there. So yeah, so I flew over on June the 30th. Stayed with some friends, uh, uh, the friends of my mum in Eastley, uh, and got taken into the Dell the next morning. And I literally got taken into the Dell. I'm 16 years of age. Got taken into the Dell, dropped off there with my I think I had like two bags and uh, and I had no idea where I was going to be sleeping that night. Not a clue. And so we were all kind of probably five or six of us in the same boat because a few of the boys were local. They stayed with their parents. But we were just put in a car with the uh, with the assistant manager at the time, John Mortimer, and uh, driven, to, driven to a house in the city. And they got literally chucked me on the doorstep and went, right, that's where you're going to be staying for the next two years. What was that like? Um it was it was quite daunting really as a just to be chucked into a house luckily the the people that i stayed with pete and pat ford um they were good as gold pete was a season ticket holder at southampton um he had two sons who were 11 and 9 i think Stuart and martin were at the time um and so that was quite nice for me you know i, I was you know wasn't just on my own it was a, a family unit there uh, and it was also quite good because i went from being the youngest of four boys who like got beat up by all their by their older brothers the whole time. To now, I'm like the oldest of three boys, and I'm just like, I can do, I can do the beating up. <laughs> the leader now. of the pack. <laughs> What's that like when you start making waves? Because you made a lot of noise from a young kid. Did you know it? Like, yeah, I started scoring it. goals really early. Yeah. Um, so, like in the, that first season in the youth team, um, I scored like loads of hat tricks. I think I scored 59 goals altogether that season. Mm -hmm. Um, we won the the Southeast Counties League by a million miles. We were just like the best team in the league, um, uh, and so that was that was really good. I, I didn't really play a lot of reserve team games that first year, though. Um, maybe just a couple towards the end of the season, I think, uh, because obviously there was senior pros and quite a big first team squad, and then a, a reserve team that had some some players in there who had been there a few years and were trying to make their way. So you didn't really get a lot of chances. Uh, and then the following season, uh, I ended up playing in uh, Nick Holmes's testimonial match against Ben Fika at the Dell. Um, and that was my kind of uh, first ever appearance at the Dell. I got taken on the pre-season trip as well. We went to um, Exeter and Torquay. We played down in Devon. We stayed at St. Melian. Um, and... That was that was my first ever appearance for Southampton first team. I came on as a sub against Exeter, um, and then it kind of when the season started, I wasn't in the squad. So, um, but after about two games, I think it was the third game, um, Chris Nickel called me into the first team squad for the first time. I was still only seventeen years of age, um, and I was about ten and a half stone, dripping wet. <laughs> so it was, uh, that was quite daunting to start playing like first division football when you're still. I hadn't really you know fully developed mm. as a as a bloke yet uh, and yeah here I was you know playing against Spurs funny enough was my first start uh, I came on a sub against Norwich uh, and then my first ever start for Saints was against my team that I supported as a boy 
What was that? And guess who was playing for Spurs that oh, night? Oh, my my hero. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was amazing. We won two 0 and I had quite a good game. So that was just I was buzzing. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I had all my family up in the stand. It was brilliant. Um, so that was kind of a, a nice little start for me. But then I didn't really establish myself in the team for for a quite a while after that. Chris Nickel used to obviously because I was still developing. Um, he never really gave me a huge run of games in the team. So I'd play like one or two games and then he put me back as sub. And I, so I spent about two or three years almost being a permanent sub for Southampton mm. until I really broke into the team when I was 20. Um, and we sold Danny Wallace to Man United. Uh, obviously, Danny was a was you know really good player for Saints. Uh, very popular with the fans. Uh, and then, you know, Danny went and all of a sudden there was a, a spare spot in the team and I was the one that was in the right place and I came into the side and started scoring goals pretty quick uh, that season and I ended up that season winning the Young Player of the Year and scoring 24 goals. Um, so that was, uh, that was a pretty special season and we finished seventh in the league that year. So mm -hmm. this is obviously before the Premier League had started so nobody remembers that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How much has Nickel played a big part in your life? Like, Kind of, uh, that's I believe that's good management, not just going yeah. in the deep end. I believe if you're good enough, you should play, but you, like you say, you're still growing, you're still, yeah. Adapting. I understand, I understand why he did that when I look back. Um, were you, you ever know, frustrated at, at, it, at the time? I was frustrated, yeah, yeah, yeah I would have been a, a little bit frustrated, but also I didn't mind just gaining that experience as a sub for like 20 minutes here, half an hour there, um, just easing your way into it gently. Um, so it. It was a bit frustrating, especially when it kind of went on the next season as well. Um, but I knew I, I had belief in my ability. I knew that once I, I got my chance, um, that I'd have enough ability to take it. Because the leagues were tough then. In the 80s, like, there's, there's no, yeah, it wasn't a snowflake two, league. It wasn't a snowflake league back two, then. <laughs> my second ever game for Southampton uh, that I started uh, after that Spurs game on the Tuesday night, we played Forest on the Saturday, the following Saturday, and I kept my place in the team. And honestly, uh, Stuart Pearce played left back. I was playing right wing for Southampton. Stuart Pearce was a left back for Forest. I just remember looking at him and thinking, Jesus Christ. His, his thighs were wider than my entire body. He was like, well, he's going to kick the shit out of me. And he, and he did. You know, yeah. and you just. He got away with you then. Know, yeah. <laughs> but you learn to deal with it, you know. You, you, you grow. And, and I, I, that's kind of when I became, a, I think I became a better player when I filled out a bit and I learned how to look after myself a bit better and I was a bit stronger physically. Yeah. Where does your loyalty come with Southampton and all that? Because there's been teams come in, Chelsea, Man U, mm. 10 million, you were apparently going to be the biggest British transfer. Like, where does your loyalty come from, Southampton and why? Um, I think my loyalty probably comes from values that are instilled in me by my parents. Um, but I also, I also felt... Um, a sense of duty towards Southampton uh, because they gave me they gave me my chance to be a professional footballer, which is everything I wanted to be in my life. Uh, and they gave me that chance to do that. So I felt like I always owed them something. Uh, and I don't think I would have been able to live with myself if I would have left Southampton and they'd have got relegated. I would have taken I would have taken that as being my fault. Now, rightly or wrongly, that's probably quite an arrogant attitude to take. Um, but that's what that's kind of how I felt and how I believed. Uh, and I always knew two things, really. I enjoyed being the big fish in the small pond. I've never shied away from admitting that. Uh, I enjoyed the pressure of the expectation of the people of Southampton looking to me to score their goals and create the goals. Um, I enjoyed that pressure. But I also enjoyed the fact that at Southampton, I could play football the way that I wanted to play it. You know, we weren't under a massive amount of pressure to win every game. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't that kind of pressure. So it meant that I was able to kind of play football the way that I wanted to. I, I It seems odd to say this because I'm a, I was a professional sportsman, but I felt like football was an entertainment industry. And the first thing I wanted to do was entertain people. Uh, and then the second thing was to try and win. Um, that's not a brilliant attitude to have as a professional sportsman. Mm. But I always, I always felt like football should be entertaining. And that's what I tried to do. And that's I could do that 
easier at Southampton than if I'd have gone to a, a, a club where they were expected to win every week. Uh, I would have probably have had to have changed the way that I played. And think because the enjoyment and then think, gets took away from it. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the pressure then becomes uh, a very different thing. And I always wanted to enjoy my football. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always wanted to enjoy my life. And that's one of the reasons as well why I didn't leave Southampton because I was happy where I was. And I never felt the need to go and earn more, more money. Um, you know, I could have earned, when Chelsea came in for me in 1995, I could probably have earned, I don't know, six or seven times more than what I was getting at Southampton. Um, but that was never m my reason for playing football. Well, I, I wasn't in football to be rich. I'm not in life to be rich. I want to be able to enjoy my life. Uh, and as long as I've got enough for the stuff that I want to do in my life, then I don't need any more than that. Um, and I think that's something that um, I've, I've had that attitude all the while. And it's only really when the government a couple of years ago decided that actually we're going to stop you from doing all the stuff that you think you can enjoy um, that I started to uh, speak out about what I thought was going on in this world. Um, and I don't, I don't know if uh, if that was always in me or if it was just because uh, all of a sudden now the government are going, well, no, you can't go and play golf. Sh golf courses are shut. You can't do that. And uh, you, you, you can't work uh, because there's no, you know, you can't do after dinner speaking because we're not allowing people to gather in big groups of 100 people. Um, and so all of a sudden uh, all our freedoms were being taken away. Uh, and I didn't think it was the right thing to do. So I decided to speak out about it. Yeah, fair play, and that's why I've got respect for you, brother. It's not easy to do so, but... It's not, um, and it's right. You, you do need a certain kind of mentality to be able to cope with uh, the criticism that comes your way and, you know, the uh, the media setting their pack of wolves on you and on social media when you, you say something that they don't agree with. Um, but quite frankly, uh, I don't really care for the opinions of morally corrupt individuals uh, so they can shout and scream whatever they want it makes not a jot of difference to me yeah you can't control outside noise but what you can control yep. is how you react to it now, exactly if you right. don't agree with the narrative or the agenda that some people push then you are ridiculed you are embarrassed you are shamed and we've got the cancel culture where people don't believe you then we have indeed i'm for be who you want to be as long as you're not harming anyone who what gives exactly us the right, right to say this is right or this is wrong because everything in my eyes is a conspiracy unless I actually see it with my own eyes. Absolutely. Me and you could read a book and take two totally different sides from it. Yep. It is what it is. It's called life. It's called having. Like I, like people want to get whatever it is, wear a mask, whatever. Listen, do what you want to do, but don't force me for and take away my choice of life. Like yep. Who controls my life, my decisions, if I'm not harming anyone? Like I get it, I ain't a doctor, I ain't a scientist, but what I have got is a gut feeling and a soul to say, wait a minute, yep. I've got to question that. Like, is these the same patterns that's been going on for fucking hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years? Like, look, even when we talk about wars, like, I love the UK, I love the people from the UK, I'm a Scotsman as well. Like, first of all, I love Scotland as well, but I love everybody. I've, I've been all around the world. I've yep, came, me too. I've, connected with so many different people and at a level that borders race religion it doesn't mean anything to me for me it's divide Absolutely. and conquer and for people it's just a sad day when you can't have a voice where you are embarrassed or you are ridiculed or for speaking out against something that you quite don't agree with like it's just because it's yep. a very small majority of people we, i don't know if it's brainwashing or whatever and we maybe see the world differently because we spoke earlier and we could be wrong at certain things and that's okay Absolutely. as well i think that's the that's the, the the biggest thing about everything is that nobody knows everything yeah nobody knows everything everybody can be wrong about something um and the way we survive as as human beings is to be able to have different opinions and be able to chat about them and not fall out with people just because we see things differently to them because at the end of the day who who is the arbiter of the truth who knows who knows what the truth is mm. you know and you say i only believe it if i see it with my own eyes well that that's fine and that's all well and good um but sometimes you can be deceived by what you see with your own eyes yeah that's true because of the because of the technology that's available in this day and age mm. so you can be watching something but not really what you're watching 
Um, you know, the the stuff they can do in television now is is just incredible. And you wouldn't know you wouldn't know what you were looking at was actually real. What's well, real? If we go back to what the sixties when you look at the moon landings, there was so much unanswered questions with that. Like flags are moving, like there's apparently nowhere in space, shadows that again, whoever's going against that grain as well and saying they're fake, that that could be false technology as well. You look at the pictures from NASA who's when they talk about the world's round flat, like I don't know. I haven't seen it, but I'm when you start you get the rabbit hole so big, you know yourself. Once you go down that, mate, you start thinking, "Are you going crazy?" That, because you don't know what's right or what's wrong. And, and I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think I've ever ever felt like I'm going crazy. Um, but what I have over the last couple of years realised is it's important to get uh, a sense of perspective on things um, uh, and to question everything. Yeah. I think that's the that's the biggest thing for me, um, and as you say, I th I think it's important when you're talking about a subject. So if you take, for instance, the the, the moon landings, if you take a, a look at the evidence that's available, mm -hmm. all the evidence that's available yeah. from both sides. So there's there's one side of, of the story that goes well. You can tell that's not real. Look at this, look at this. Or them going, oh, clearly it's real. This is what we've got. This is what NASA have told us. You should be allowed to just have both those points of view and be able to discern for yourself what's real and what's not real. You make your own decision on what you believe to be real based on the evidence put in front of you. Mm -hmm. And then you, you listen to your gut and you, and you make a decision. Uh, I wouldn't ever now outsource my view of something to an expert just because he said this is what's happened. Uh, when somebody says that, uh, I will then want to know, okay, that's fine. That's that's what you're saying. What's your conflict of interest? What do you gain from saying that? Mm. And it, it's it's always, I think now I tend to look at things when I hear things and I question, okay, what do you stand to benefit from that? Or this bloke over there who's saying this stuff, what does he stand to lose from that? You know, what, what has he got to gain? Has he got anything to gain? No. Uh, what has he got to lose? Well, everyone's going to think he's loony and he'll probably lose his job, but he's still saying it. Mm. Now, I'm going to be more inclined to believe this bloke because... He's standing up for what he believes in and he's going to lose shit because of it. Yeah. But he's still saying it. Whereas this bloke, have a look where, what, what shares he owns and where's, where, where's his funding come from? And then correlate that with what he's saying about the subject and does there, is there any conflict of interest there? And if there is, then that makes me doubt that person. Simple as that. He might still be right, but it's going to make me doubt him. Mm -hmm. How is that for you, Matt, to be known as one of the greatest to ever play in the English football league, that to be scoring over 200 goals, over 500 appearances, to being a, a presenter, that to then being kind of, not blackballed, but we don't need you anymore, that did you ever feel used at a certain point that nobody's really came at the forefront and said, you know what, I stand behind you, Do you know, or even somebody that says, I don't believe in what you've got to do, what you're saying, but it has a point or... Everybody has an opinion. That um, I think. I think what we need to really have in this country is um, be able to agree to disagree on things. So, and and be able to agree that even though you might disagree with me, you should still be sticking up for my right to have an opinion. Because I will stick up for yours. I dis I might disagree with what you say, but I will. I will never tell you you're not allowed to say that. Or I will never ridicule you for what you believe. If that's what you believe, that's what you believe. Let's get on with it. What was it like when you were playing football? How was your mindset? Were you just caught up? As you say, it was, it was entertainment because some say that as well. You were on the football game, but feed them bread and water and they forget what's actually going on in the real world mm. because people devote their life to football. Yeah. But again, there, there is more to life than football. I love football. I played it for years. I still play it to this day. But yep. when you look at the bigger picture, it can be another smokescreen because people are so caught up in it day in and day out, signings, football games, it's non-stop where they actually don't think for themselves. And, yeah. and that can be a scary thing. Like, did you know this while you were playing football? We no. just starting to see it now. 
just uh, just starting to see. I tell you what, um, certainly when I was when I was playing, all I was concentrating on was was you know playing football, staying mm. fit, trying to score as many goals as I could. Just I loved it. It's brilliant. Um, so I didn't really think from the from a fan's perspective about it because I was in the middle of it. Um, but I, I did notice that um, I believe now, looking back, when the Premier League got uh, suspended um, and they were, you know, trying to get the season back on the way, I do think that that that's the the efforts that they went to to get football back on the way um was was a distraction it yeah. was to keep to keep the people distracted from the decisions that our government were making and to stop people actually looking into things um and uh realizing just exactly what what really was going on behind the scenes um and yeah i think it it was a definite distraction so i've had david icon he was a goalkeeper he went on the wogan show over 20 million people watched it and they ridiculed him and embarrassed him. Look, I don't agree with everything the man says, but there's a lot of stuff I do agree with. And I'll say this to him. Look, do you feel that sort of same ridicule just now? Um, no, not really. Um, I, I don't uh, I don't feel in myself that, uh, that I've been ridiculed. I feel that I've been unfairly um, represented uh, in my views in the media. Uh, and there have probably been... Um, maybe one or two times that I probably didn't help myself with the examples that I used uh, to highlight the media manipulation uh, and the propaganda that we're subjected to. Um, but I, I, I certainly feel like my views have been misrepresented um, by a lot of people in the in the mainstream media. Uh, and obviously there's a reason for that is because uh, I don't no longer fall for their propaganda. Uh, and so they will try to ridicule me for that because I'm questioning their entire existence and what they do for a living. So it's pretty obvious that any opportunity they'll get, they'll try and jump on me. Uh, but as I said before, um, morally corrupt people, their opinion doesn't interest me. Yeah, there's corruption everywhere. In my opinion, on wars, I believe there should yep. be no wars. I believe there is absolutely there should be no wars in this day and age. We're in the 21st century. If we as adults can't settle disputes by talking to each other instead of getting tanks out and killing people, sending kids, what the hell? I mean, seriously, where have we where have we come in hundreds of years? It's just it's just crazy that we we have to resort to having wars in this day and age. Yeah, nothing changes, but you look at the war, we're talking Russia, Ukraine, like I speak to Russian people and they agree what Russia's doing, Ukraine people, they agree what they're doing. We've got to look at Britain as well. Britain's invaded nearly every country on this planet. Over 90% of the countries we have destroyed. It's a very powerful country now. None of our athletes have ever been banned from a competition, have they? Never, and I, I don't believe that anybody's right or wrong with wars like, because nope. it's so fucked up it's the guys with the suits sitting behind that. Why don't they get into a box and they fight it out and do whatever they've got to do that? Like, you look at the war in Iraq, like nearly 500,000 people were killed for apparent um, uh, weapons of mass destruction yeah. and it was found out there was no weapons of mass destruction. Tony Blair's just been knighted. Like, is this what it's came to? Like, I could be wrong, but again, when when they've admitted they've, they've admitted, fucked up, yeah. <laughs> like, then, then you go, your answers are there. Like, I don't know too much about the wars. I just know there shouldn't be wars. I don't understand no. that there's got to be some sort of human beings just can't run for a free-for-all there's got to be some security i get no. it but and why is young kids dying left right and center like, i've interviewed many people who's been in there i mean their heads are fried i do a lot of homeless work in glasgow the majority of people on the street are homeless have been fighting in battle that like, they're willing to fight apparently for to help protect you but yet hmm. when they come back nobody fights to protect them so i believe the world is waking up to a lot of things I believe I believe that um, with most wars, uh, I think if you if you find out who benefits from there being wars, you'll you'll probably find out where the problems really lie. Mm -hmm. so if you follow problems. the money, if you follow the money, you'll you'll find out. Mm -hmm. When you were working on Sky Sports, like, what were you were you kind of knowing what was going behind what what you were visualising or what you were. Kind of research, and were you doing any of that sort of research there? Were you, like you say, you can go down the rabbit hole? Or were you just content with your life, 
going and being a pundit, going back to your missus, that was um, everything just Yeah, no, it's sweet? only really it's only really been the last couple of years um where I've started looking uh, a little bit closer at, at what's going on in the world. And it's yeah. It's probably a, a selfish thing from my point of view because, you know, I was I was a footballer, I was I was a pundit, I had a job. Um, you know, that job allowed me to uh fund the lifestyle that I wanted. Um and I kind of wasn't really interested in politics at all. Not not at all. Uh and it was only when it kind of started really impacting uh on my life that I kind of started to take a bit more notice of it. Um and so from that point of view it does yeah, it feels like I, I feel like I've been a little bit uh, selfish down the years because it was a bit of an I'm all right Jack attitude and now it's affected me all of a sudden I'm speaking out so I could understand um, if that criticism was to come my way but you know that's that's the way my life has gone and um, you know I, I wouldn't change anything that I've done these last couple of years Did you get sacked from Sky Sports? Or did you stay uh, yeah. down? Yeah I, I, we are, oh, I had uh, seven months left of my contract when we were told there was no more work for us how was that feeling after 20 years? Um, how was it feeling? Yeah, I was probably, see, I've, always, I've always been confident that I, I can you know, make a living um, whatever I choose to do. Uh, so I wasn't overly fussed about it. Um, but my, my wife was obviously very concerned because obviously there's a big chunk of money that's now not lo no longer coming in. Um, so she was a bit concerned, but, uh, as it turned out two years later down the line, hasn't really impacted, um, financially, uh, on us as a family. Um, so yeah, uh, I've got to be honest that I actually, given what transpired over the last couple of years and the, the way that the, the mainstream media have reported on things and have frightened the shit out of the population. Uh, I'm quite relieved not to be working for them. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. When you start speaking out with certain things that we speak out about, we don't, we're not throwing it in people's face and saying, believe is this and that, no. but just question everything. Like, question, uh, we're questioning things yeah. and I'm not expecting everybody to believe what I'm saying. Um, but what I would expect everyone to do is maybe just question things and, and have a look for yourself. Um, because not everything that you're that you're told on the news is is the truth, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, it's a sad state of affairs, but um, that's the way the world is at the moment. Uh, and so we should all be allowed an opinion. Nobody knows all the truth. Uh, so I think to get criticised for having an opinion after you've done a little bit of research on on certain subjects. Uh, by people who only listen to the BBC News. I think that's probably one of my biggest bugbears mm -hmm. um, when uh, when people want to uh, criticise you and you go, what do you know about it? And they go, well, I heard on the news the other night. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, stop you there. Uh, go, and have, go and do some thinking for yourself, <laughs> please. Just stop believing everything you hear on the television. Mm -hmm. Because it does brainwash you. You look at fucking the Jimmy Savile stuff. Do you know what I mean? How he flew under the radar is beyond me. You just, you don't judge a book by its cover, but fuck me, you sure judge him. Like, why he get away with so much? And it must be hard as well, the amount of celebrities he crossed paths with, because you don't know the, the extent of it. But there was a lot of whispers. Like, who was it that came out? He used to, he was he sang in the band. Oh, he, was a, he sang in a band. He'd done the God Save the Queen song as well, but he spoke out about Sab on one of the shows and he got blackballed. Oh yeah, Johnny, no, Rotten. Johnny Rotten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, I remember you know that. I mean? yeah. How does that guy get into the royal family? How does that guy working at hospitals and charities and doing what he done, yeah. man? Like, I mean, uh, you have to ask yourself. I mean, he, uh, he was quite close with Prince Charles, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to ask yourself if he was that close to Prince Charles, how much did Charlie know? You know, if one of your best mates is a wrong and like that, there's a fair chance you know about it. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but those questions will never get asked. <laughs> um, and they'll never get answered. They'll never get answered for sure. Uh, and yeah, it's just it's just bizarre to me that the, the BBC even survived after that, mm -hmm. knowing how much they covered up for him. Uh, and just bizarre. 
Um, but yeah, that's the corrupt world we live in. BBC have still got a statue outside it with a naked man, a naked kid, and a guy who made that statue was a paedophile. And they've still got it on the front of the building. That now you but, can go into the Epstein stuff, you can go into the, the Gwen Maxwell. What's her name? Gwilyn. 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 Yeah. Maxwell, where she's exposed and named so many different people she's worked with. Not one of them are in prison. It's, it's incredible how that that whole trial was. Yeah. I mean, it, it barely got a mention. Um, you know, it's the the names involved on that island, Epstein's island. It, how how are they getting away with it? How are they not even being asked questions about it? You know, even if they weren't, you know, even if they weren't guilty of any crime, the fact that they were on that island, the fact you know what that island was about, it came all came out in the trial, and yet none of them would get questioned. Not even question, not even a question mm -hmm. from the authorities. It's just bizarre. Sickening as well. But the amount of people that were on his plane, look at the state of Prince Andrew. Look at his interview. He just fucking screams out wrong. And do you know what I mean? Like, and yet, again, it's it's all put under the carpet. They'll, we'll, we'll show Will Smith slapping somebody on the Oscars and it'll be world news. Everybody talking about uh, yeah. it. Everything else flies under the radar. It gets a bit of publicity, but not as much as it should. But like, this is the mass cover up. You look at the Hollywood as well. You look at the shit that's going on there, man. The people that look at like it, it was it, no Epstein, Weinstein. Yeah, but this shit goes deep and deep and deep. And when you speak about it, people going, "He's fucking crazy." But if you actually look into a few things, the sources, the people behind it, coming from the horse's mouth, you add it all up, and you realise how fucking sick the world can be. Yeah, it's just again, you give them bread and water, you fill them with entertainment, whether it's football, basketball, baseball. People are so caught up in that little bubble, yeah. they actually forget to ask the real questions. That we could be wrong that what we do and what we're seeing and the things that, I don't know why I've been looking into the stuff that's came across my I, like, I would no, never no. thought I'd be sitting with Matt Letizia four <laughs> years four years ago I was in a crack then full of coke and alcohol life going nowhere to then digging in and doing a bit of research and just asking the question well wait a minute something's not right here yeah. my job is to give yeah. people the platform to talk about things from their side why they get involved in that like you say you were caught on football you are caught on punditry for so many years being a family man trying to be the good guy and then obviously you've woke up to this and you're thinking, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> no. Do you know what I mean? Because you're so blinded by it. It is, yeah. It's uh, it, it's just been a really bizarre couple of years. <laughs> it really has. <laughs> I was just like, I just wanted to, I just wanted to earn a few quid and play <laughs> and play golf three times a week. Do you know what I mean? Just um, leave me alone. <laughs> Well, uh, interesting times. Who knows where it's going to end? The funny thing is, but it, like, well, it's not funny, but it affects family members and friends. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think How that's, that's the that? worst bit. That's the worst bit, I think, is that, um, yeah, there was a time like probably a year, 18 months ago, where my family were, <laughs> I think my family were worried about me because they thought I was going crackers. Um, I think they, given what's transpired, they now kind of think, actually, um, there might have been something in what he was saying. <laughs> uh, and, you know, thankfully my, my parents have uh, decided not to have any more uh, jabs. Um, and uh, I don't think they think I'm that crazy anymore, thankfully. Um, yeah. But it is, it's tough for the people around you. When you're, I mean, it doesn't bother, as I said, it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, it really doesn't. I don't care for the opinion of morally bankrupt individuals. It really doesn't bother me. Um, but, you know, it, it bothers people around you. You know, your loved ones don't want to see you coming under fire. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times I tell them, it doesn't affect me. Yeah. You know, the amount of people that, that rang me up a couple of weeks ago went, are you okay? You've been getting a bit of stick in the media. I'm like, I don't care. I really don't care. Um, all I care about is that the people that I love, my family and the, my closest friends, they know what kind of human being I am. Uh, they know what I've done for people in the community of Southampton. Um, they know how much I've helped uh, people less fortunate than myself over the last 30 odd years. Uh, and their opinion is, is important to me. Uh, and they know that, you know, I'm not perfect, uh, but they know that my heart's in the right place uh, and I try and do the right thing. Yeah. And that's all you can do. Like, I'm not a scientist or a doctor. Nope, like, me either. I don't know about 
but got common sense. jabs, this and that. But again, you look at the cardiac arrest that's happening to footballers. Is there a connection? Again, I don't know, but part of me feels there is. I respect guys like Novak Djokovic, put out the Australian Open for standing for what he believes in. If you want to get something, then go and get it. But I'm all for a pro-choice. Yep. Don't force something upon no, me. Absolutely. Don't take away my rights and the things that I love just because you want me to get something to go and enjoy that. Then for me, then you're taking away your human rights. Absolutely right. And I understand that people are fearful because if you're stuck in the house watching the news every day, people are drugged with fear. So it's okay yep. that they're going to go against me and think that I'm causing all these deaths because I'm not wearing a mask, I'm not <laughs> doing this. Look, that's fine, but... What about the fucking people who wear the same mask for three months, six months, the amount of germs that's in the same mask? Like, you don't want to look at these big companies. Now, the pharmaceutical industry, if you're honest, it kills more people than anybody on this planet. Yep. Don't get me wrong, there's some pharmaceutical drugs that maybe help people and cure them. I get it, but again, are they going to create cures where they run out of business? Why would or is they? it more customers? So common sense then makes you question that. Like, you, don't have to be, you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a doctor to have common sense now the pharmaceutical industry do not want to cure people because if they if they cure people they'd go out of business because everyone would be healthy and they wouldn't be needed so why would they why would they do that why would they ruin their own business all they need to do is to keep you just well enough to keep needing their tablets mm. and that's common sense you know I don't know don't need to be going to university to work that one out did you ever get any jabs or anything while you were playing football? Um, actually, the football club um, uh, did make us have, well, I say they make us have, uh, they recommended that we had the flu jabs um, when I was playing football. Uh, and I had a few of them. Um, and I think one year, I think one year towards the end of my career, one year I, ju I just had a, I actually got the flu quite bad just after it. Um and then the next year, I, they went, well, you can have a flu jab. And I was like, oh, last year I had a bit of a, a bit of a bad reaction to it. So I said, I don't, I don't think I'll take it this year. So I didn't. And then I haven't, I haven't had one for the last 20 years. Funny yeah. enough, I haven't had flu for the last 20 years yeah. either. <laughs> <laughs> See, your pain at least 47 out of 48. Why were you, why are you classed, obviously the record speak for itself, but the best penalty taker on this planet. Like, why, why was your penalty so good? How did you judge taking a penalty? Um... Uh, I think the first, the first thing is mentality. Uh, I wanted to be there, so when the penalty was given, I looked forward to taking penalties. I didn't feel any apprehension. I just felt like, oh, what a great chance this is to score. So, firstly, positive mental attitude, first thing about it. Uh, and the second bit uh, to complement that was that I was able to side foot the ball quite powerfully. Um, I had good technique and I could get real good pace on a side foot so I knew if I side footed it into either corner the keeper's going to have to make a really good save or he's going to have to move really early to save it uh, and so when I would take penalties I would always go for the goalie's left first of all but if he if he moves too early I, I always I had good peripheral vision so even though I'm looking down at, at the ball what I'm really doing is I'm looking over the ball so I can just see the goalkeeper's image so the frame and I can see if he moves uh, and so there were times when I literally would change my mind which corner I was going in literally that far before I hit the ball because I've seen the goal because I've seen the goalkeeper move towards that corner that I'm going to hit it um, so I think the, the combination of being able to hit the ball powerfully with a side foot being quite accurate uh, and also positive mental attitude and having the I don't, know if it's I don't know if it's confidence or arrogance, uh, having that ability to not make up your mind where you're going to hit it until the very last second. Having a, having a preconceived idea of where you're going to hit it, but only acting upon that right at the very last second. What was it like missing your first one? Um, my only one, actually. Your only one? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mark Crosley... Um, bastard yeah <laughs> i'm playing in his golf day next week um i uh he went to he went to go towards my corner that i that i hit it in mm -hmm. but he just he just shimmied a little bit and then flung himself the other way and he timed it just right so that i saw the shimmy bit and i changed my mind and he just went dunk, dunk, and he and he went the other way and saved it so it was, yeah fair play to him it was a decent save but the worst bit about it and this is this was the I'm more embarrassed about this. 
is that when he saved it, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you haven't, you can have a look. He palms it straight back to me. And from about seven yards out, I've managed with my left foot to smash it over the crossbar. I was like, it's a fucking open goal. How have I missed that? So I was more penalty. embarrassed about the rebound, which was easier than the yeah. penalty, uh, than actually missing the penalty. But I did, you know, I, I always say, you know, obviously Mark was the, the only goalkeeper that saved one of my penalties, but he was also the goalkeeper that I scored the most penalties against because yeah. I took five against him. Is that you fired him so back I'm four one up. <laughs> <laughs> you only get eight England caps. Is that yeah. something that you believe you should have got more? Uh, obviously, I believe I should have had more. Um, uh, but um, I, I also am aware that back in the nineties, when I when you know I was on, in good form, um, there was a lot more English talent to choose from than there is probably in this day and age. If I'm honest, when you look at um, the amount of quality strikers and goal scorers and uh, who probably didn't get that many caps despite scoring huge volumes of goals. Um, it was it was a lot more difficult, I think, to get in the England side back then. And I didn't, it probably didn't help that I uh, I stayed at Southampton because you def there was definitely an advantage for players who were playing at the big teams when it came to England squads um, because I was operating for most of my career in the bottom half of the table. You, the spotlight isn't on you so much um, and it's much easier for an England manager to to pick somebody who plays for Man United and Liverpool, even if they're not that great, yeah. because because they're playing for Man United and Liverpool, so and, done. and they'll they'll this is this I, I think it it's one of those things that's uh, it was an easy I was an easy player to leave out of a squad because of who I played for, mm -hmm. so, so they weren't going to get a lot of criticism for leaving me out, but they might have got a little a lot of criticism if he left out a Man United player or a Liverpool player. Uh, because they'll, all them fans from Man United and Liverpool will go, well, what's the England manager doing? He's picking a bloke who's playing in the bottom half of the table. He's playing at Liverpool. They're challenging for the league. Why isn't he not? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. Actually, Even though you are valued that the most expensive player that won the tight at that time, over 10 million. Like, uh, yeah, Chelsea, when Chelsea tried to buy me, I think it was, I think it was 7 million in the mid 90s, um, which was quite a lot of money back then. And was that an automatic no? Yeah. Glenn Hoddle was manager of Chelsea as well. How about that? For a twist of fate. <laughs> do you so, think that was the fear? You talk about people not wanting to leave where you grew up. But do you think that was because you were so settled as well? You partly had another fear of change, maybe? Um, I don't know, really. I don't, I don't know if it's fear. It might have been a little bit of fear of change. Um, I, I kind of coped all right moving to Southampton at 16. Um, you know, moving to Oxford at like 14 was a bit was a bit too early, uh, I think. So I don't know. Um, I just think I was I was happy. I was in my comfort zone. You know, I was happy, and I thought, why should I why should I risk giving that up? That's what matters, though. It's happiness. Exactly. You see players moving on to bigger teams and end up miserable. There's some great players come through Southampton. Gareth Bale, even Big Van Dyke was there for a few years, I believe. That. Like, what was Shearer like? What was Alan Shearer like at Southampton at the start? That's where he started his career, was it not? He did, yeah. Alan was uh, an apprentice the year below me. Um, so, yeah, I was, a, I was a year and a bit older than him. Um, he always had a great mentality towards football, great attitude, um, strong. Uh, he was, he, even though he wasn't the most talented player, you knew that he was going to have a career because uh, you could see his desire was unbelievable um, and he made the most out of every single ounce of ability he had for him I would never have said when I played alongside him in the youth team at, at Southampton and you would have said to me this boy will go on to be the Premier League's greatest goal scorer I would, I would have looked at you and gone you're fucking mad aren't you uh, because he wasn't that that kind of player and it was only really when he went to Blackburn um that he really started scoring a lot of goals. He didn't score a lot of goals for Southampton. Um, you know, me and Rodney Wallace uh, outscored Allen comfortably. Um, and then when he went to Blackburn, his game changed uh, all of a sudden because Blackburn had wingers who, you know, I think he had Stuart Ripley on one wing. I think it was uh, Jason Wilcox, I think was on the other wing. Uh, and so they had these wide players who didn't want to cut inside and try and score goals like me and Rodney Wallace did. They just, all their wide men want to do is cross the ball in the box. Now that's 
food and drink for Al, you know, and he literally hardly ever moved outside the width of the 18 yard box the whole time. He was at Blackburn and he just let these guys get the ball, whip the ball in and he was on the end of it and he was brilliant at that uh, and it suited him perfectly. So what a player. He what a player. Yeah, what a player. Unbelievable record. For, for him to be that far ahead of anybody else in the Premier League history is quite remarkable given that obviously he played three or four seasons before the Premier League as well, so they don't count those goals. Mm. Uh, and also, when you think that he had some horrific injuries, which put him out for, for quite a while. You yeah. know, he had a couple of knee injuries there, which, you know, to come back from those, uh, I thought he did brilliantly. So when you take all that into consideration, for him to be that far ahead of everyone else is brilliant. Unbelievable. Again, it's not a start you probably want, but between you and Shearer, it was only one trophy won between the both of you. Maybe one or two of that, probably two. One, yeah. Yeah, Al's Probably. Premier League with Blackburn, that was the only one he, he won, wasn't it? So I think he won a That's cup, fucking man. phenomenal to think yeah. that you have only won one trophy between you. Yeah. Is it's that funny, a regret ever in your mind? I, I've never, I know, because I didn't, I wasn't really playing football to win trophies. Yeah. I wasn't. I was, I, You've always been kind of fucked up, man. I wanted. I just wanted to entertain people. I just, basically, I was, I, basically, I was just a show off. That's yeah. what I was. I yeah. just wanted to show everybody just how good I was at football yeah. by doing ridiculous mm. things on a football pitch. Because he never, he never left Newcastle when he had big offers. I yeah. think from Barcelona. This well, when that. he left Blackburn, he had, I think he could have gone to Man United a couple of yeah. times. You know. Um, and I think if you ask him now, he has no regrets. He became Newcastle's all-time greatest scorer. You know, how good's that? I mean, he's, you know, from that city, you know, used to go on the Gallagher end as a kid and watch. Uh, and he beats the record of war Jackie Milburn. I mean, that was something else. Considering the age he was when he went to Newcastle in the first place to, to get past that total yeah. after having done what he'd done with Blackburn and Southampton first. Another great penalty taker. Uh, you say that. Yeah, no, not a great penalty taker. You. No, no, not a great penalty taker. That's penalties were top corner. Yeah, but he missed a lot. Did they? Well, you get that dig in there. You know, you're the number no, one no. penalty taker, well, Matt. I, no, I think I think this is this stat is right. It was it was a couple of three years ago, um, but Alan was the the player that had scored the most penalties in the Premier League. Hmm. But he was also the player that missed the most penalties in the Premier League. I don't know that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was right. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I, I say he wasn't a good penalty. He, he was a decent penalty taker because his record was, was pretty good. I mean, he's probably still got a, uh, a percentage that is above the average. Mm -hmm. You know, the average is about, I think it's about 81, 79, 81% of penalties get scored. So I think Alan's percentage was a bit above that, but mine was way above that. 98%. <laughs> Easy work, isn't it? Well, how hard was it for you to retire, Matt? Ah, oh, it was horrible. What was it was horrible. I, 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 to this day, it's just a... I, I'd had, I was 33, it was our first season at St. Mary's. I'd had a lot of muscle injuries, I had a lot of calf strains. And I, I just kept trying to come back uh, into training and kept breaking down, the calf kept going again. And then I remember playing one game at, at St. Mary's in a reserve game. Uh, you know, it was about, it was about February of that season. And, uh, I played about 25 minutes and all of a sudden I went to run off and it was just like, ping, this thing, and the calf's gone again. And uh, and at that point, I, I knew it was about the fourth or fifth time that, I, that it, the calf had gone that season. And I knew I couldn't, I couldn't do what I used to be able to do. Uh, and I got substituted uh, and I knew then, that was the moment I went, bollocks, I can't do this anymore. I can't do, I can't do it. Uh, and I remember walking down the tunnel at St Mary's, went into the medical room. Uh, I sat down on the on the medical bench in there, and um, I'm not too proud to admit I bawled my eyes out, um, uh, and I was uh, I was in in floods of tears, knowing that that's it, that's the end. I'm I'm, I'm this is my last season. I'm not going to be playing football again next season. Uh, and uh, Gordon Strachan, who was manager at the time, uh, was actually he was at the game. And he'd seen what had happened. Um, and after a, a couple of minutes, he'd come down into the medical room and he'd see me, see the state I was in. <laughs> uh, and he was brilliant, actually. He just, he just looked at me and, he, and I just went gaffer. I said, I can't, can't do it anymore. I said, this, is, this will be my last season. I said, I'm retiring at the end of the season. Uh, and he went, 
He went, no, he said, uh, he said, I understand this. He said, I might get that. He said, but just, just so you know, he said, you've been very lucky. He said, you've played football in an era where every great goal that you've scored is on camera. He said, and you can show your kids and your grandkids what you've done in your career. He said, you should be very proud of that. And uh, and it was brilliant of him. And I, and I just sat there and I went, yeah, fair play. I said, yeah, that, that that's nice. Uh, and then and that was it. What's your best goal? Uh, the best goal is, is a goal I scored at Blackburn um, against uh, my old mate Tim Flowers from about <laughs> 35 yards. Um, that one, I think that won the match of the day goal of the season. Uh, mm. So that was one I was pretty proud of. Um, but it, it, that's my best goal, but it's not my favourite goal. What's your favourite goal? Uh, so my favourite goal um, was the last goal I ever scored for Southampton, which was the last goal I ever scored at the Dell. Um, we were uh, drawing two all against Arsenal. Uh, again, I'd, I'd struggled with injuries that season. I hadn't scored a Premier League goal the whole season uh, and uh, I was only on the bench out for sentimental reasons, really. And Stuart Gray, who was our manager at the time, said to me, look, he said, I know you're not, you're not really fit enough to be there. He said, but for what you've done for this football club, he said, you deserve to be on the pitch at the end of that game against Arsenal. So whatever happens, he said, I will make sure when the final whistle goes, you're on that pitch. So uh, he told me that about four or five days before the game. And uh, and I can remember th just thinking I, every night from then on till the game, every night I went to bed and all I could think about was how I was going to score the last goal, how I wanted it to be me that scored the last goal. Um, and so when I had, a, I had an opportunity, and it was weird because it's one of those, it's a mentality thing again is that I, I'd kind of gone through loads of scenarios in my head about how I was going to score this last goal at the Dell. I wanted it so badly to be me. Um, and it didn't matter what kind of chance I had. I knew as long as I had one chance, it didn't matter how difficult it was going to be, I knew it was going to go in. And when the ball dropped to me, it was quite difficult. It was behind me uh, on my left foot, you know, and on the half volley, I had to swivel a little bit. It was It was probably only, I'd say... If I had that, if I had that shot again, I'd probably score it one out of twenty times, maybe more. It was it was quite difficult, um, but as I said, all I all I needed was half a chance, uh, and as soon as it dropped, and as soon as it left my foot, I, it was unbelievable. I just knew it, the keeper couldn't stop it. Um, I knew from where I was how I'd struck it, and I I literally as soon as it hit my boot. I pretty much started turning away celebrating. I don't think it even hit the net before I started celebrating. Um, and so the the noise that the stadium made that day, you know, that was the winning goal, 3-2. Um, and the noise that the stadium made that day will live with me forever. It was an, an amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. I think you deserve that feeling. Who's the greatest player you've ever played against? Um, I always would say two players when I'm asked that question. Uh, in the Premier League, I think Thierry Henry was probably the best player that I played against in the Premier League. He was one of, he was one of only two players really who I've seen in the Premier League, um, who I thought sometimes it was like watching an adult playing kids football. So it'd be like me at 28 rocking up and playing in an under 14s game, right? And sometimes it was watching him. It was like that because you just couldn't stop him. It was unbelievable. Uh, and then in 1992. We had a pre-season trip to Italy and we played against Juventus. Uh, and I got to play against Roberto Baggio. Yeah, he was special. Mm -hmm. He was special. Uh, he didn't have the, the electric pace of, of Thierry Henry. But what that boy could do with the football, his touch, his vision was just amazing. So I'd say those two players. Would you have loved to have been in any other team if you could pick one? What would it have been? Oh, it would have been the Spurs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but that was my team as a kid. And I actually turned them down in 1990 um, <laughs> when Terry Venables was manager. I know it's mental. Uh, um, so that was, you know, that was probably the hardest thing I had to do. Um, I was just about to get married at the time, and uh, my, my first wife didn't want to live in London. Um, Blaming so, your wife, Matt? Are you? Well, no. I I made the decision. Um, you know, 
I was uh, I, I, it was basically a choice. I either got married or I, I joined Spurs. That was divorced, it. I suppose. So, <laughs> so I did. Get, yeah, I got married, and then six years later, I was divorced. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, but to this day, I, I don't regret it. Uh, you know, I made the decision. Uh, I don't blame her. It, it, you know, that was her. That was her opinion. That was her thoughts. She she gave it to me, and I took them into consideration, and I made the decision. Um, so I've got no regrets about doing that, uh, and I would never blame her uh, for doing that because I don't regret staying at Southampton my whole career. I loved it. You seem to be a family man. You seem to do everything for your family. You seem, is that worth the mum and dad kind of growing up and your brothers that? Yeah, I think I, I grew up in a in a really tight, close knit family, um, and they also helped. You know, having three older brothers also meant that, that they would never ever let me get too big for my boots. They would also never let me forget where I came from, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's something that I've tried to uh, take with me my whole life. Um, I I know where I grew up. Uh, I know I've been very lucky in life. Uh, I know not everybody's been as lucky as me. Uh, and that's why I try and and do as much as I can um, uh, to help other people less fortunate than me in the in the city that I've decided to make my home in. How good was it, like Man U players in the nineties when they came through the Beckhams, the Schools, the Butts, the Nevilles? That did you see them in the nineties? They were a good team, or did you? Was it just good management how it brought them all together? Um, because they were so no, powerful. I think there was a there was a good bond between those guys. Mm -hmm. You know, came through. The, it all came through in the same youth team together. It was it was amazing, and uh, to have that amount of talent in the same team was pretty special. Obviously, they needed a manager who could, you know, make sure that they fulfilled their potential, and they had an unbelievable manager to do that. So it was a combination of, of a couple of things. Um, uh, and so that was, you know, it was a pretty special time to be a Man United fan. I think, and to be a Man United player, I guess. So Alex never trying to get your well, manager strip. <laughs> I, I never officially heard anything from my agent um, that they were interested. Uh, but I think he, he, he has said uh, that when Cantona left, um, he, he did think about wanting to, to try and take me to Man United. But I think he made some inquiries and, um, uh, and he found out pretty quickly that I wasn't going anywhere. That I was quite happy where I was and I didn't want to move. So, uh, so it never went any further than that. How do you feel that void, void now being a football man your whole life, doing it punditry, like football is in your blood, like no matter how we question it now and maybe look at different things, it's still ingrained in as well. We love it. Like, even when you speak about it, how happy you were smiling, like, you love it. Like, your oh, yeah. are there. I was watching your goals last night. Like, some of the best goals ever scored in the English Premier League. Like, it's an unbelievable start to have. But how do you feel that void now? Do you still f do you feel as if... I know you're, you've went against it now and you think well fuck it I'm going to start speaking the truth and how you feel but as part of you miss it Matt um, not really I don't, I don't miss it because I still watch a lot yeah um, you know I, I, I still watch football uh, I'm still doing a bit of punditry um, so uh, I'm doing a bit of work for a company called Mola who have the Premier League coverage out in Indonesia and um, they have the Dutch League as well so I've been covering that league as well uh, that's been interesting, learning about a, a new league as well, because I didn't really take a huge amount of, uh, of notice of the Dutch league uh, per se, apart from when their teams were playing in Europe, really. Um, so, so that's been interesting. Um, so I don't really, I don't really miss it because I still, Do I'm still involved in it a bit, mm -hmm. and I still play a little bit with my mates. You know, we've got a charity uh, match coming up on Friday night. Our ex Southampton players team, we play. We've probably got half a dozen games in this summer that we that we play. So still play a bit. Um, and yeah, so I don't, I don't really miss it. And I've, and I've kind of, the competitive side of things, um, I've kind of uh, replaced that with golf now. So I absolutely love golf and uh, I play three times a week probably, maybe sometimes more the wife will tell you. So see when you left the Sky Sports and then you, you stepped back from being an ambassador to Southampton, was there anybody ever that you've worked for through the years and stood by you and, and showed their support for you? Or was everybody just leave you in the dark? Um, well, Southampton Football Club have been uh, have been okay. Um, to be fair, it was my decision to step down as, as ambassador because they were getting a lot of stick um, from people for me being an just for me being an ambassador, even though I'm not an employee of the football club. You know, uh, I'm I'm not on their payroll. Um, so uh, to stop them from getting uh, the cancel culture mob. Uh, writing emails into them and phoning them up and going, Ooh, Matt Dizzy shouldn't be an ambassador. He's got some funny views um so uh so i took the decision myself to uh remove myself as, a, as an ambassador 
uh, to stop the football club from getting hassled, basically. That's that's as simple as it was. What other stuff were you looking into in the last couple of years that makes you question it and go, have you ever looked into stuff about the Twin Towers and fucking, there's so much shit that you can go down the rabbit hole and you, like you say, it does, I was so deep in it for so many years and I thought, man, I need to stop this because it's making me question everything, even yeah. like Walt Disney and Disney and like subliminal messages and I'm thinking is this real is it fake and then I'm questioning what I'm giving the kids to watch like it can really play a major effect on your life and it can it do. then makes you take away the fun in life because then you question everything yeah I think you have to be very careful um uh, because you're right if you if you if you go too far uh in in that way of thinking it, it will mess up your life um and you'll end up tying yourself in knots because like we said before, nobody, nobody really, very few people know the truth about a certain subject. Uh, so you can all have your ideas, um, but you're right. It, you, you don't want it to mess up your life and stop you enjoying life. So all this time while I've been, you know, speaking out and questioning things, uh, I, I've never allowed myself to not be happy. So it's always important to me still to, Yes, I'll question everything, and I'll do my research, and I'll and, I'll, uh, and, and sometimes I, yeah, I'm quite happy in the knowledge that uh, there may be some really bad stuff going on in the world, um, but I might be wrong. So I'm, I've come, you know, I'm quite happy that you know I can have my ideas and I can have my opinions. But I'm also happy that if I see something or somebody can present me with enough evidence to make me change my mind, then I'm happy to change my mind, you know. Um, and, you know, there's there's so many things that you kind of you read about. And if you if you want to, um, you know, who who you think the good people in the world are, who the bad people in the world are. Uh, and at the end of the day, we don't really know. So I don't allow myself to get too wrapped up in it. Um, and I kind of take everything with a pinch of salt. And, you know, if who these people think are the good guys turn out to be the good guys, then brilliant. Great stuff. And we'll all have a lovely, happy world afterwards. Um, but if they don't and the world goes to shit, uh, I'll, I'm, you know, in, I'll be happy in the knowledge that, you know, I had at least 50 years of a decent life um and uh achieved everything that i set out to achieve when i was a little kid so happy days how's that has anybody ever approached you to challenge your views on the streets or anything yet it, it's amazing actually um because you get a lot of love and support in, on people in real life well. yeah but people people in real life you know when you actually meet people face to face you'd be amazed i went i went to turkey week before last had a week's holiday over there and the amount of people in the resort that came up and shook my hand and went, thank you very much for speaking out. It's nice that you can speak out and represent the people without a voice. Um, so I think there is a bigger percentage of people out there that we think, uh, than we think don't know what's going on um, or uh, don't have similar views to, to the views that, that we've had. So, and in real life, I, th I think I've had one bloke. I think I had one bloke call me an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. What does that mean, mate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're anti-vax, you're anti-vax. I went, yeah, I know, but what, what does that actually mean? Well, you, you, you don't like vaccinations. I was like, well, ask me how many vaccinations I've had in my life. Uh, and what do you mean? I went, well, I'll tell you. I said, I've... Every childhood vaccination, I, I had all them. And I had the flu jab, or, you know, most of the time when I was growing up and being a footballer. Uh, I said, so I've decided on this one that something's not quite right because of the time frame that was involved and there's no long-term safety data. So I've decided for this vaccine, I'm going to wait a little bit and see what happens. Now, does that sound like an anti-vaxxer to you? well it's not mate you know i've just been sensible and i'm thinking for myself i'm checking out the evidence for myself and i'm making my own decision if you want to believe everything that you read uh you go ahead and you take that risk i ain't taking it mm -hmm. 
it's see for people because I speak to a lot of people who's got big platforms but yet they're too scared to, to speak out because they'll lose sponsors or they'll lose their job this and that like, what do you think when you see these people can you understand their fear as well that they can lose everything yep I can understand their fear um, nobody wants to nobody wants to lose everything um, and what I would say is that there are opportunities on both sides of the fence so uh, I think also, you know, when you, uh, what I've what I've found certainly is um, having a different opinion to everybody else um, hasn't meant that I haven't been able to earn a living still. So and I, I you yeah, know, I'm much happier as an individual earning a living from the way that I do earn a living uh, as opposed to having to rely on money from sky mm -hmm. is there anything that sticks out to you which made you question that you never thought you would question because i go down i can look at gfk killings i can look at paul mccartney being went missing from the beatles and have replaced them like it's irrelevant to my life but it's still <laughs> you still think that like, it's tupac living in jamaica like i know it's crazy but you can go right down it and yeah, you go wait is that, obviously it's all majority is all crazy but is there anything in your mind you thought well wait a minute I, like, even the moonlanders i question that now and i always thought man they sent somebody to the moon. I don't know if it was 1960. Obviously, now you question it. Why has people not been back to the moon? Yeah, this is this, that was that was kind of one of the questions that, and I think I saw an interview with somebody who said, "Oh, we we can't go back to the moon because uh, we destroyed the technology that we had." Yeah, and I was like, "What? You did what? Uh, how, why are you expecting me to believe that?" Um, so uh, you know, who knows. Uh, I don't know enough about it to have an opinion one way or the other, but I, I've looked into it. Um, uh, it's it's fascinating. It, it really is. Uh, and, you know, UFOs is another one that I kind of looked into and now actually just starting to see a little bit in the media the last few weeks, uh, a little bit more about UFOs. Um, because that's another uh, whole situation where, there seems to be a lot of evidence, uh, but not a lot of people talking about it. Um, so I think a lot of people believe that there are UFOs and, and I think the the weight of evidence is that, is, you know what, probably, we're probably not alone on, in this world, you know? Um, and, it, and that wouldn't surprise me one bit. What do you think as human beings, Matt, that our purpose is in life? A that's a, question, that's a that. deep question. Yeah. It is a really deep question. Uh, what is our purpose? See, I, I think I, I was put in this world to entertain people uh, playing football. That's, yeah, that's what I felt I was like. Uh, I don't know if, if now, my <laughs> now my second job is to, uh, is to try and get people to think a bit more laterally about things in life and, and, mm -hmm. and just not take for granted willy-nilly that people on, <laughs> the people on television are telling yeah. you the truth yeah uh so that, i know that might be my second calling in life after <laughs> after entertaining people in football do you think <laughs> though, do, do, like, do you think like what the fuck is going on from like being a top class world-class footballer man even the punter through was unbelievable because your knowledge of football is second to none to then thinking and questioning everything and losing your job losing possibly marriage breakups and family and friends not really want to see you because they think you fucking should be in the <laughs> mental asylum like does it do you ever did you ever think that do you question that what the fuck is going on like now with your own life and your own beliefs and all um, certain things that's going on i think you do start to to kind of question uh your own beliefs um you know i i, I i've the good thing about it was i've never i haven't fallen out with well not that i know of anyway i haven't fallen out with any of my mates or, or my family um, because of the views that I've had. So even though I've, I've had views that are different from the mainstream, um, I've always presented them in a way that isn't going to offend any of my family or friends, you know, and I have one of my, be one of my, my best mates has completely the opposite opinion to me completely the opposite about how the world is run and uh he was a former policeman um take from that what you will 
Uh, and um, we've had, uh, I play golf with him all the time, and we have some really, really good chats after we play golf in the bar afterwards about what's going on. And I give him my opinion, he tells me his opinion. Uh, and it, and it, a couple of times he got, you know, got quite heated, and I, I, I got clear what you're on about. And, uh, but the good thing is, at the end of it, we go, oh, well, never mind. See you tomorrow, mate. And we shake hands and off we go. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't fall out about it. Um, and I just think that's the way the world should be. You should be able to have different opinions and uh, and not be able to, yeah, have, you should be able to have different opinions and not fall out with people. Just have a discussion, talk yeah. the way we're talking. Like, exactly. And just, we don't know. The answers yeah. people watching that we don't know. We, yeah. We're just picking up things and watching certain things that could be fabricated, but yet yep. it's intriguing to us because we're experiment hunters, humans. There's always something missing. We're always intrigued. So if that is intriguing us, again, it yep. could be wrong, but, when you're yeah. going against the masses and now I realise if you go against the masses and part of me starts to believe that there's a good percentage at the small percentage is right and that's what I'm questioning more because even the education system to what we're doing is sit, you know, we're sitting at a table now but you're sitting at a table from five years old to learn about wars to learn about history why? let's talk about the now let's fucking plan for the future let's talk about goals let's talk about yeah. exercise and meditation or yoga and eating, growing your own fruit and veg. Because even in the lockdown, if the supermarket shut down, where the fuck would we vet? Because a lot of people haven't got a clue Aye. how to grow their own fruit and veg, like, including me. Yeah, well, me I too. would have been fucked. I would have had to <laughs> went back to the Stone Ages and try to do what I had to do to try and survive. But there's so much missing and it scares me how fast your world can be shut down. I never thought I would ever see that shit no. in my day. No. That how everything just shut down and people just, well accepted that people's mental health struggled yep. addiction went through the roof everything there was more absolutely every, and increased in so many other things but there was no pandemic over that but yeah I've, there was a massive pandemic over listen there was deaths of course I get that oh you're speaking out about this but my grandma passed away listen I'm sorry for that but there's people dying every day from starvation homelessness fucking cancers heart attacks more people die through that, but there's no, there's, there's no uh, pandemic, and there's it, no and closing it's not, down bookies or off sales. Like, and it's not reported every not single reported day with the numbers exactly, in the yeah. in the media. So you just question that. And it's not that I'm against your grandma for dying. Like, I get it. People do pass away with flus. It's life. It, we can get fucking struck with a bus, but just don't give me shit for questioning certain things. Like yeah. people have got two jabs, a booster, but they're still sitting in their car with a fucking mask on, and people <laughs> and, are still and locked catching down. COVID. Yeah, and still catching <laughs> it. There was a it was that scientifically proven that there was more people who had been double jabbed and boosted that had COVID. So don't give me shit for just questioning that. And I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But again, that's pro choice. Let me and I think that's choice. the thing. That's the thing with with people on our side of the argument, if you like, is that we we don't profess to know everything, and we are open to well, most of the people that I spoke to are open to the fact that they might be wrong. On the other side of the argument. They cannot see that they could possibly be wrong. Mm-hmm. They are they they are just blinded by the media, uh, and that is what they see as the truth. And you know, I, I'm not sure. I, I think I'd probably want to be on the side of the people that are willing to look at both sides of the story before making up my mind. Yeah, I was getting accused of. Co- I was getting accused of starting COVID. Like starting viruses at one point because I was wasn't wearing a mask and I get it like some places you need to and you need to abide by certain rooms but again like I think that was the biggest the biggest thing about everything is that is that they convinced people that they could be carrying a deadly disease and yet have no symptoms whatsoever mm. that that they could pass on to other people and you're like that doesn't make sense. Yeah. That that just doesn't make sense. I, I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. Yeah. But common sense, that makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Doesn't. Yeah, and I understand that people were so drilled with fear that they're going to get angry and frustrated. But again, we still worry because we can lose our livelihood. We're yeah. only speaking against a certain thing and, and going maybe against the grain. But again, like you say, we could be wrong. I can't remember who said it, but... Uh, I, it was a quote that I saw a, a few weeks back, which I, it made me smile. And it said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to step back and think again. Yeah. yeah you, can, <laughs> and you can understand that. And you got a lot of love and support on Twitter, Matt, but going forward for the future, like, where do you see, what do you see you doing? 
<laughs> flying to the moon, fucking being a scientist. But... I'm going to land on the moon <laughs> and <laughs> in my cardboard, <laughs> in my cardboard yeah. spaceship. Uh -huh. And uh, I have no idea uh, where life is going to take me. All, do you know, all I really want is for, is for my government to leave me the hell alone. Mm. Stop imposing stupid rules on me. Uh, and I'd like to see the world return to having proper democracies where the people actually get a say in the government. Um, not sure we've ever had that, but uh, it would be nice if we lived in a world where uh, your vote actually counted for something and, and where having a different party leading the country um, meant that you could go in a different direction as opposed to uh, what I feel at the moment doesn't really matter in this country who's who's in charge because at the moment I don't think either of them really make the decisions. If you were Prime Minister, Matt, what changes would you make? Oh, blimey. We've got uh, time for that answer. Where, where would I start? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where would I start? Uh, I would um, I, I would make sure that uh, freedom of speech was the most important thing in the world and could never be cancelled because that's what's trying to happen at the moment. Um, uh, I would make sure that you would never uh, lose your ability to be able to protest against the government, which is what they're trying to do at the moment. Um, so they're two pretty important things, uh, I think. Um, uh, and I would make it abundantly clear or, or try and make a law that um, would force anybody who became an MP uh, to disclose who's funding them, where they're taking money from. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, and I think the, the most important thing, in fact, two, there's two organisations, maybe three. Uh, there's three organisations that, that I would shut down. Um, uh, the first one would be uh, the World Economic Forum. The second one would be the World Health Organisation. And the third one would be the United Nations. Last question, brother. For anybody that's watching, that's maybe doing their own research and maybe try to understand the world a bit more and question everything, but maybe too scared to come forward and speak out with their own opinions and own beliefs. What advice would you give for them? Um, I think I, the best advice I can give to people is to um, listen to your heart, listen to your gut. Uh, you, you know, your gut instinct is, is there for a reason. Um, uh, and I think if you can block out all the noise, all the outside noise, uh, and and listen to what your heart's telling you, and go with that. Then you you won't go far wrong in life. Yeah, listen, brother, for coming on today. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Fair play for speaking out. Nothing but respect for you for that. And that's the way it should be. Speaking the way you feel, and, and that's again, I'm all for that. But for coming on today and telling your story. Thank Cheers, you, brother. Pal. God bless.